Ciao ragazzi! This is Katie Portanova, and you're listening to Florence and Me. I'm a lover of stories and all things Italian, and I'm going to bring you all that in this podcast. My intention is to inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and explore life and travel the world. Join me as I tell you my story and many others about Italy and my love, Florence. Andiamo! Ciao ragazzi. I am so excited for you to hear this interview with my girl, Chelsea. Chelsea Ward is an amazing person, um, a really good friend, and has so many amazing things to talk about with me, about Italy mostly, Woo-hoo. everything about Italy. So let's get into the episode. Chelsea, thank you so much for being on my podcast. I'm so excited to chat with you. Yes. I'm, so, I'm so excited because we both have an equal love of Italy and we are obsessed. Just and a little. Just, just, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, so let's first talk about how we met. Do you remember how we met? <sighs> we met in, like any modern friendship now, in an Instagram DM. Yes. And I talked to you about this yesterday, how it was just so odd and how nice it was to have somebody actually, um, you know, want to talk to me. And like X talk to me about Italy and actually give me like insight about what you do, what we're going to talk about. So let's, let's tell the folks of um, this podcast about the fabulous Chelsea and her beautiful companies that she has. Go. I'm, I'm Chelsea. Um, I first ended up in Italy in 2009 on a study abroad trip for college. It was just for six weeks in the summer, but I like many people, became addicted to Italy. So I applied for an internship after graduation and ended up flying back to Italy the day of my graduation and spent the rest of the year there in 2010. Um, And now I run Sketchy Notions, which is a greeting card company. And then in the summer and fall, when it's permitted by the EU, I host art retreats in Tuscany (laughs) under wonderful retreats. Yes. And those of you that don't know Sketchy Notions, you got to. So I'm going to link her site to this um, this episode. I have bought all my cards from her. I feel like I don't go to the store anymore. I don't even want to go to Target. I just, and I actually was thinking I should have bought more Mother's Day cards. I totally forgot, but I have some. Thank God. But still. Um, yes. Yeah, so she runs wonderful retreats and that's how I found her through Instagram. And we both have this, like she said, a love of Italy. We both studied abroad. And it's funny because I I think we talked about this, but when you were here in Italy, I say keep saying we're here, like I'm still in Italy. When we were here in Italy in 2010, I was still living there. And we thought to ourselves, like, how cool it would have been if we like we totally overlapped at some point. We probably passed each other on the street in Florence or who knows. But I think it's just like a really cool. It's a, it's a really cool like friendship that we've created. And like, I'm very grateful for you um, giving me all the insight that you have on your retreat business. So, um, so let's talk about your obsession with Italy. Cause I like to do that. So what is, what is like your, like when you first arrived, what was the first thing that you were like, oh my God, I have to stay here longer. Well, I definitely attribute Italy to my love of watercolors. Like before going to Italy, I really hated the medium. But when I studied abroad there, all my classmates brought oil paints and um, acrylics, which meant that they had to be stuck at easels in the studio. I'm just like, I don't want to be stuck inside this whole time. So I want to go out and wander. So I bought a little travel watercolor set and I had my sketchbook and I just explored. And that's like Italy gave me my favorite medium. It gave me um, my two businesses today, essentially. Um, But just kind of essentially getting lost in the little tiny hill town is what made me addicted. Like this is just so charming and idyllic and like nothing else in the States. Like I just wanted more of it. 
And I love that when you said getting lost, because I talk about that a lot on the podcast, because that's all I did when I was studying. I just got lost and I forgot. And this was before GPS, before cell phones. Avoid. It's the best. Getting lost in Italy is the best. Yes. And like just finding your way back to the Duomo or back to the main square, back to the piazza. It was just like the best thing. Like it's the most we, fun you've ever had getting lost anywhere. Yes. And also because at the time when we were like younger and like single, like, you know, we get a little whistle on the street, like, woohoo, like, oh yeah, hi. Like, <laughs> hello, like, yeah. hello cha cha <laughs> yes. That's like the best. Oh my God. So it's a nice self-esteem boost, that's for sure. It is. And my sister, I'll tell you this quick story because this is just coming up. My sister, when she visited my younger sister, she was in the midst of CrossFit in which I think a lot of people know what CrossFit is, but so she was doing like handstands everywhere. So I took her to Rome. I took her all these places and she was doing handstands everywhere. So in the middle of like probably more residential Florence, like near where I was teaching English, she stopped. She's like, Katie, this wall is great. I'm like, okay. So she did a handstand and her shirt kind of went up, but she had like, you know, sweats were on. And these guys like stopped like in their like scooters and like, Wee! and they're like, oh, job. And my sister's like, what the fuck is going? I'm like, this is what they do. I'm like, Josie, how am I? Like, wave it. It was I've got a sister story too. <laughs> oh yeah. Then tell me yours. Yeah. Uh, the first year I did retreats, my sister came on it and there was one, uh, there was one scheduled free day. We decided to go from Florence to back to my little town. So we got up early and we we're walking to the train station and it was an older guy. And I was just like in the zone. It's like, we got to go. We got to go. And this older guy was sort of was like, Jabella, Jabella. And just like, like less, like, this is fun. Like you're more creepy, Jabella. Yeah. And I just like turned around, like, no, vai via. It's like, it's like, no, go away. It's like protective <laughs> yeah. of my little sister. It's like, oh. She's like, what did you just say to him? Just, oh my God. That's so oh funny. God. Sisters in Italy. It's very fun. It is very fun. My sister, like, I think she enjoyed the attention because she was just like, yeah. And at that time, I mean, not saying, Emmy, you're listening. I know you are, but you're still in great shape. But at the time she was like really fit, like six pack abs like everything so like anyway the scooters are gonna stop (laughs) oh yeah I was afraid there was gonna be an accident honestly it was it was crazy I'm like oh what is the screeching then we fixed and oh it was crazy anyway um so talking about Italy as a drug and now I lived there you lived there as well I lived there for almost four and a half years permanently as a resident when I think of Italy just because of all the bureaucracy and all the um the tax, all the, th- all the things, all the things as, as if, you, if you've lived in Italy, you know, all the things that are like incorporated into living there. It's hard. It's a hard life. Um, and I remember another story. I remember going up to my friend, my husband's friend's place in Tuscany somewhere. And I remember looking out the window going like, and this was right towards the part where we were thinking about moving back uh, or coming here, Stefano moving here. Um, and I looked around, I'm like, God, and I just think, I thought to myself, and it's funny you said that to me yesterday, I literally thought Italy is like a drug because it keeps bringing you back for really great reasons, but it's really hard to break the habit. Like, yeah, you just need like, like a fix every summer. Yeah. And that's why I think because I created Truly, Truly Italy tours, like I want that fix like every year, even if it's not visiting Stefano's family, but like Tell me about like how that feeling of like needing that, especially with your art, because I know you put it into your cards and you put it into your retreat. So how does that fire you up? Like uh, it's just like I am so much more productive when I'm there. And like it's a one time in the year I really just like get to make stuff for myself. When I'm here, it's usually product driven. I'm making cards for like holidays four months in advance like I need to start looking at Christmas and Hanukkah cards right now and it's only May but when I'm there I will like every trip I take back I will make a brand new sketchbook before I leave and it's just giant like inch and a half thick sketchbook and like the only goal is like I'm going to fill this while I'm there and I'll just even it's a little tricky during the retreats, but like the sketchbook is used for documenting all the places that we go. And then I'll do exercises in there and like demonstrate how to paint this and that and sketching because everybody on the retreat gets their own little sketchbook. So it's good to like model, like this is what you can do with it. But then when the retreats are over, it's just 
a frenzy of painting and sketching and I'll just walk and sketch, walk and sketch all day long. I just, it is, it's addicting. And then it's just, it is just such a drug coming home with a new sketchbook every time filled with like new restaurants that I've gone to and like new people and new places that I've visited. And it's like, those sketchbooks are my babies and just evidence, like the bookshelf is an evidence of the addiction now. And I just want another one at the end of it every year. Totally. And I think you have such a, and that this is why I'm addicted to you now, because like I have all of her uh, audience, like I have a few of her paintings like in my house. And now I like just want those paintings. I honestly, honestly, I'm saying this. It's not just, Thank you. Podcast, but I like, she is like a really cool. Now I'm, she's really selling me on this retreat now, because now that I canceled my one in Puglia in September, I really want to go because I'm interested in art and I've worked with art therapy. That's really helped me um, mentally, and emotionally and stuff. So anyway, we'll talk about your retreat at the end because I want to, I want to plug it for sure. But okay. I have a few questions. So I thought I'd like, we can talk more about like what, if you have other stories, feel free to like, we'll, we'll throw them in there because you know me, I like to talk about it all the time. Um, so what is, what, what is the, 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 um, the thing you miss the most about when you were living in Italy? It's the little things I miss the most. Like when I was there for the internship, I would usually take Um, for the internship I had over there, it was at a study abroad center. And as interns there, we were kind of like dorm RAs. So like out in town, we were to help any kids that were lost or needed, like go to this coffee shop. It's great. And then like walking them home if they were drunk in the evenings, because it's their college kids in Italy. But then our other jobs were like working in the kitchen and we were in charge of organizing any like fruit and veggie deliveries into the fridges and the freezers. And we also ran like the little cafe um, slash bar in the study abroad center. And I really loved the morning shift because I'd get up early and I'd walk to the um, little alimentari and go get the milk. If we were out, I'd pick up the pastries on my way back in. And it was just like, I had my quiet little morning, make my cappuccinos and then make 20 more for everybody else. And I just liked like how simple my routine was. And it's like, I have nothing, I have no shift in the afternoon. I can just go sketch and get a gelato in town. I miss having simple routines and just little, little tasks that would feel so bothersome over here. were just so idyllic over there, like getting milk and the people that ran that store were just lovely. And it was nice to kind of feel like a local. Yeah, totally. And I resonate with that because I had a little fruity vendolo guy. His name was Eugenio. And he called me Chicagese whenever I would come up. <laughs> hey, Chicagese, this is what we have today. Look at all the beautiful vegetables. And, Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I love that simple because that's, I talked about that on my last episode, like how have having things that are simple, simple recipes, simple plates of pasta, simple, just simple things. And like, I feel like, and you can, you can say this if you, if this is true for you as well, but I felt like I was a lot more present when I was mm-hmm. living there, especially, yes, I had, I had gotten my first iPhone because I had Stefano and he had the money. No, I was kidding. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that was like at, towards the end. But at the beginning, like when I moved there in 2009, like I didn't have a, I had like a regular freaking so- phone, no smart, nothing. Yeah. And uh, just being able to sit in like a, a panino shop and just like chat with people and just like focus on what they're talking about. And, like the presence is what I feel is like what we miss when we come back to the States because yeah. as a, a, apart from what happened last year, now we're all present mostly, <laughs> but like, I feel like there's a need for that more. And I think that's why our retreats are so much are so useful for people to kind of unplug and sit back and sketch and paint and just like have a gelato. How does that taste? What is that mm, yeah. what are you feeling? Like, so I don't know. I think the the presence part of that is what I feel like I miss a lot of just being present with people. I agree. And definitely like, it feels very fleeting now going back. Like when we were both living there, it was just like, yeah, I'm living here. This is home. But now it's like, I know the day I get there, there's already like the hourglass is already running out on when I have to leave again. Yeah. And like, there definitely is 
like the necessity to, f- to f- the necessity to feel present there. Just like I'm only here for these many days. And, like I need to take advantage of this. And like, yeah, I may be tired and jet lagged, but so what? I could sleep in when I get home. I could sleep on the flight back home, but that espresso is not going to taste as good when I get home. So I might as well just go to a little coffee shop and hang out for a bit and sketch. Exactly. And that's why you should look into buying a house when you retire and you can live. Oh in a God. Yes. House. Oh yeah. yeah. No, we're already talking. It's like, yeah, we'll just split our year up. It'll be like a third of the year in Italy, a third of the year in Israel, and then a third of the year in California. <laughs> that sounds yes. awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's, that's ideal. I swear. Uh, okay. My next question. What is your favorite pizza? Oh dear. Um, it's a hard one. No, no, no. Mine's easy. Um, okay, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's a, it, I will always opt for quattro formaggi. Uh-huh. If they can do cinque formaggi, even better. And I want spicy salami on it. There's a little yes. spot in Castilla the guy's like, he offers a five cheese. I'm like, yes, that. And I want spicy. Oh, yeah. and there's a couple like, others in that little town too. Um, they're like very specific just to this one little pizza shop, but he's uh-huh. got some really great flavors, but my default is always four or five cheese with the, with the spicy salami on top. Exactly. If I can, and if not that, then it's like Dow's and pepperoncini, like give me spice. Oh, yeah. I like, I like simple and lots of cheese. Wow. I didn't even think of five cheese. I've never heard of that. No, I'm going to want to ask for that. It's what so which five cheeses are there though? Let's be. I don't eat I really, Gorgonzola no. probably. No, no, he didn't no. do Gorgonzola. I think it, like the fifth cheese was Buffalo on top of it. <laughs> well, of course. Yeah. It's just like, I will, I don't know what is on here, but it's just <laughs> molten and melting and I yeah. want it in my mouth. Nobody yeah. should say no to Buffalo. Mozzarella yeah. di Buffalo. No. You always no. say yes. If they ask to put it on top, yep, you put it on top. A salad, a pasta, whatever. You put it on top. I yeah. would possibly even do it on top of gelato. Oh, God. Yes. Oh, God, I'm getting hungry, even though I'm just <laughs> on green juice. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, now I'm like, I'm now I'm blanking on what I was going to say for my favorite pizza. I usually like, um, because Stefano likes this one, and I only knew it because Stefano would get it. Marsco, uh, Marsco pone cheese with uh, speck. Oh, and the, with the I would never think to get that and a sweetness and the little saltiness of the speck. And you can't find speck here. I mean, maybe yeah. you do. I don't know, but you have to go. I to feel a like, yeah, it's got to be a very niche deli. Yeah, but it's never the same. Like we've gotten prosciutto di parma at one of the grocery stores here, and someone's like, "This is not it." I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just prosciutto in front of my mouth. It's good. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I kind of lean towards that one, but I also would always go for a margarita because they mm. are just the simple, simple is better. Yeah. You know, don't need pineapples or French fries or anything else on top. Like, like some people do. Yeah. Um, your favorite pasta dish in Italy. Let, let's be specific. Like it's made in Italy. You're there. What is the one you go for? when you're I there? have to have cacio pepe every summer. Stefano's favorite too. He loves it. I have to have it. Like it's an easy one to replicate here, but there's just something about it there. It's like, they just get the right ratio of cheese on it. The noodles always taste better. Like it's one that I can make here and like, this, this is good. This is close, but, and that like, it's yeah. Catch a pepe hands down. But, but but let's say like, okay, so that would be more summer, right? A summer Mm -hmm. pasta dish. What would be like a winter pasta dish you would want? I would. I'd actually go ribolita over pasta ah, in the go. winter. I would opt for ribolita yeah. like that. Um, I nannied for a family. So the first time I ever had ribolita, the mom and the family made it for me. They ran a restaurant. And we lived on top of it, um, like on top of a mountain. It was incredible. It was there. Mm-hmm. It was in uh, Lignano. So when I was working at the city abroad center, still, I wanted to Lignano. make okay. cash. It's super cute. It's between Castiglione, Fiorentino and Arezzo. And then we were like tucked up this mountain and it's this area that had not so much of a petting zoo, but just like come see these animals that are in little pens up here in the forest. And like there was an area for barbecuing and a playground and people would camp nearby. So they were somewhat of like the summer cantina where you could like get a pizza and then go picnic in the park. And they had coffee and beer and wine. And then they ran a restaurant. 
-hmm. And then we lived up above it. And then my little room was like in the attic, almost above that. Like, it, it, we were just on top of a mountain. That's and so I was there in the fall and the mama Liche, she made ribolita. And it was the first time I ever had it. This yes. is incredible. The fresh oil on top of it and everything she made was epic. Um, oh my but God. I would like, ribolita is one of those like yes. easy comfort foods for me now. Like if I'm having a bad day and Louie, my boyfriend notices like ribolita is it. I won't want ribolita. And I would skip pasta for a good bowl of ribolita in the winter. Yes, that's hearty. Yeah. Yeah. For my winter dish, because Stefano makes it all the time, spezzatino. Oh. Spezzatino, yeah. So spezzatino, those of you guys that don't know, we should have uh, talked about what ribolita is too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, spezzatino is like big chunks of meat and basically stewed in like a passata, red sauce, and then spices if you want, whatever. Um, but Stefano makes it really good because he lets it sit. So the meat's like really, really tender and uh, it's really good. It's very hearty and it just like melts in your mouth. And explain what ribolita is for those that don't ribolita, know. Ribolita, it means reboiled. Um, so mm -hmm. it's old veggies. You can make it with fresh veggies, which is fine. But the whole idea is taking like your stale bread and making it into something else. So it's stale bread that's like cooked in with veggies and like stew. And then when we do it, we put even more bread on top of it, douse it in olive oil and stick it under the broiler. So it gets all crispy on top. And then you can throw in some Parmesan on it. It's, it's there's cannellini beans and there's carrots and a ton of veggies in it, tomatoes, and then a ton of like stale bread that someone probably would have thrown out otherwise, but it's turned into a delicious stew. Yeah. That sounds delicious right now again, even though so it's good. to get warm, but still, it sounds I'll take this, the summer alternative, the panzanella. I miss panzanella. <laughs> panzanella I was just going to say that. I, was I just love panzanella. Say, I used to make that for myself and mm -hmm. then that would be my meal. I would take it with me on my bike and then whatever yep. I would have. Same here. Break in my, in my day, I would eat that. Um, or I would make a lot of rice, like cold rice dishes, like like what we'd say pasta salad, like, and just like bring that with me, put like veggies in there. I do the same thing with like a farro salad. Yeah. Yeah. It's farro. Yeah. Oh, I love farro. Oh God. I do too. Okay. Oh my God. We can talk about food all day. My favorite <laughs> pasta dish. Let's see. It has to be, um, it has to be spaghetti alle vongole or mm. le cozze with the muscle. Yeah. Because muscles are literally my my it's it is a drug for me as well i love mussels and capisante okay i'm done now i'm just, now i'm diverting okay but my, <laughs> my favorite pasta dish because when i first tried spaghetti alla vongole i tried it on the seaside with a bunch of fiorentini and like i was really nervous because i had had i had eaten fish but i hadn't eaten any shellfish yet mm -hmm. and this was 2005 i'll never forget this and i tried it and my friend michelangelo is like isn't it good i'm like and I like freaking like licked the plate with my bread. Oh, like it was so, so good. good, so light. And then you realize like I just ate pasta. It's the middle of the summer, and I feel so light. I don't know if you felt like that ever when you're on the seaside. And you're like, oh, I can just go in the swim, and oh my god, because I the, could have five gelatos after this. Yes. Yeah, I have <laughs> so many gelatos I can eat after that. Thank God, I had this light pasta. Um. Okay, next one. Your favorite cocktail in the summer? Uh, spritz is always my favorite, but I do love um, Ugo. Ugo? What's that? Or Hugo, Hugo, Ugo. Like every bar I've asked for it, like they say it differently. It's just like, I don't know. It is elderflower syrup oh. with Prosecco, mint, and lime. It is so light and refreshing and delicious. Um, it is definitely one of those summer, like I'll, I'll drink spritz year round, but like yeah. an Ugo, Hugo, Hugo, like it's just so summer for me. I've never heard of that. They're delicious. I only heard about it um, maybe three summers ago. A friend of mine had ordered it at our like garden bar in Castiglione and just like, I, what, what is this magic? And just that became our go-to. And like, I, I swear, like every bar we've asked for it at, everyone says it a little bit differently. So it's just like Ugo, Hugo, or you go. Like, I've seen it spelled like with a Y or an H. And then some people just say Ugo. Yeah. I have to look that up. It's still freaking delicious. Holy crappy. Wow. It's very summery. Um, yeah. So I could drink a picture of them and not oh have God. a problem. <laughs> Sounds like it. 
Yeah, you can I, make them in the states too. It's hard to track down like the elderflower liqueur, yeah. but if you can get it, like, it's delicious to make. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now I want some. I need to go to Bevmo. <laughs> like, what am I get it back in the kitchen? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I my go to is definitely spritz. Um, I do like a nice white wine when it's mm-hmm. like you know when I can't when I don't want spritz anymore. But um, I we started making this here, and I don't know if you know this alcohol. It's called Italicus. No, what is that? You got to look it up. You got you'll find it at Binnie's or you'll find it at like whatever alcohol distributor you have. Italicus, C-U-S, is it? Italia, Italicus. It's in, it's in a, like a really cool bottle. It's like a light blue. And um, you can make it just with the, like the spritz with Prosecco mm-hmm. and club soda. Yeah. It's just as light, but without the, you know, the strong Aperol taste, obviously. Yeah. But Italicus I found because my brother-in-law used to work for um, a distributor for um, spirit, spirits and stuff. So he said, oh my God, try this. So yeah, so now Stefano found it. Oh. It was forty dollars where we when he got it, but it was still good. I like, have to get it. Like I'm like okay, we drank <laughs> it all on that weekend. Um, yeah, so that favorite cocktail, good. Um, what is what is the first place? I think I might have asked you this already. When you go back in the fall, what is the first place you're going to visit when you get back? Like first place, if, if it's a coffee place, a, a, a fruity vandalo or a restaurant or. or I will probably like, I'll be flying into Rome okay. and I will just go to the nearest coffee bar and just get a cappuccino. So I don't care if it's three in the afternoon, but nope, I want one. I want yeah. it now. And yeah. then probably gelato after that. Yes. Yeah. Like just get, get an espresso, what, gelato. get some gelato. Gelato, what'd you get? <sighs> Pistacchio. I, that is my barometer for how good a place is. Like, how good is your pistachio? Like if your pistachios, like, no, like any, I need the graininess to it. I need the taste like there are actually nuts in it. Like if you make a good pistachio, I will eat anything you have. That is my, that's my bar. Yes. I think the first place I will go, if we fly into Florence, well, I'm definitely going to go to my in-laws, but that's besides the point. But the first place I'll- <laughs> That's a given. Yeah. The first place I'll visit when we get back to Florence is I have to go back to my church. And I think mm-hmm. I told you about my church. Yeah. Santa Apostoli, Amburgo, San, Santi Apostoli. Mm-hmm. I have to go back there. And I'm, I'm determined to find the history of that church because I can't find any deep history about that church in any of the books that I have. And I have a lot of books. Yeah. And I talked to little story again. I talked to the priests there in 2018 when I was there with my mom and my sister. And I told him like, I'm really interested in the history of this church. Do you know where I can find a book? Because I would like to write something about it or learn more about it. And he told me to go to the Liberia San Paolo, which is right behind the Duomo, which is where um, the Museo, uh, what is it? Um, Opera del Duomo, where yeah. they have all the stuff from the Duomo. It's like right next to it. And of course, when I wanted to go to it, it's close because it's the middle of the afternoon. So I want to go back there too and like get and find that and see if I, somebody could find me a book on, on that church because it mm-hmm. has so much history. It's like one of the first churches, which I found out when I read so many things, first churches that was part of the Roman empire. Cause it was in the, the original walls of the, of the city. Cause mm-hmm. it's right at the edge night next to the river. So yeah. it's really cool. Oh, anyway. Second. Um, little side note, little tidbit for my, my people that like history. Um, first Italian phrase you remember learning. <sighs> it can be a bad word. <laughs> I, when I lived there, it was very bad. I'll tell you off air. <laughs> we don't oh, need to record okay. that. Um, but okay. my friends, when we were students, yeah. I, I think it was like when some video was going around online, it's like, I will cut you was the thing. So like my friend with her Italian, like figured out how to say like, I will cut you. And it's like, like, just like <laughs> so that just became our joke for the summer. And like, we had a woman that was teaching us Italian yeah. when we were studying abroad. And we had a friend in our group who he was learning Italian with a very Texan accent. And so it was like, yeah, so I'm a fragola. And just like, so that became our joke for the summer too. I was like, I am a strawberry and I will cut you. <laughs> oh my 
my God. That's so uh, there were more joke phrases. We learned more practical stuff too, but those are the two that stick out in my mind. Yet. Yeah. It's like that first summer, it's like, I'm a strawberry and I will cut you. <laughs> that's so funny. I, I've i already told everyone my first phrase, which is, Vorrei un bicchiere di vino rosso. Yes, Masi, I remember. Masi at the bar in PSLA, he's, he made me repeat it like a million times before he could give me the glass of wine. It was hilarious. <laughs> um I had the right accent everything but I remember when I was hanging out with a lot of Florentines <laughs> and and half Florentines half Americans and this was more towards 2000 2005 when I was there and um there were a few girls that really just couldn't get the language and they were still students but they were like couldn't get the language so there there's like I think this was the girls that were with us that might have been just people like tourists that we've heard but like we would try <laughs> There was one guy that was like trying to get with this one girl. This is what I remember on um, this one Italian man. And I forget if it was one of my friends, but anyway, and he was trying to teach her how to say buono. And because she was of a Southern descent in like Southern Texas or something yeah. like that, she'd be like, bono. Oh my God. Bono. And he's like, no, <laughs> like, but he was so determined to make her say it. Oh yeah. Did I tell you about the time when I, um, when I was nannying, um, the little boy swore at me. No. So it was, I was coming in on the tail of like one other nanny. They usually had nannies back to back and her time was running out of like being over there. So I came in one night to kind of like test drive how it would go. Like the kid could meet me, meet the parents, do the routine, see if it was manageable. Yeah. And then the regular nanny got the night off. And I think she didn't know a lot of Italian. So I have a feeling that he was just kind of pushing all the buttons. It was like, I can get away with saying a bunch of random stuff and she doesn't get it. So we had like, he and I had a good day. Like we played, we ate dinner, got him ready for bed, get him bath and it's time to turn the movie off and get him ready for bed. He's like, no, stronza stai zitta. And this is a four-year-old that just said, bitch, shut up. <laughs> just like, and so I yelled at him back in Italian. It's like, oh, she got what I called her. I mean, just like, oh my God. I think the poor nanny that was before me just had no idea that he was calling her names all the time. Oh my um, God. That is. Cool. It was very funny, but it was just like, this is going to be fun. <laughs> nanny. I know. Now, I will tell you when I'm, I have another, I have a story to piggyback off of that. Um, when I was a nanny, the kids did not do that because I, I was able to understand them, but that would have been really funny if the three-year-old Maria was like, you stronza. Um, mm -hmm. But no, she wouldn't have done that. But I was, when I was teaching, I was teaching a group of people, adults um, that worked with the customs for the Florence airport. And I was teaching them a class. There was probably about 15 of them, all adults. Okay. There was a few of the, there was a few guys that literally did not want to be there. And usually this is what happened when I taught English. Like a lot of the companies that made them learn English is because they work with English companies or they're at a bank or whatever. A lot of the universal language in business world in the Europe is English. So they have to learn something. So a lot of these people did not want to do it. And mostly it was the men. So it was really funny. So I was sitting at, imagine this, I'm in a long table in this really huge room, long table. I'm at the head of the table. I'm 20 something years old, late twenties. And all these older adult, well, older adults, they're, you know, mid, middle age people, but of, of a stature that they think that they're hot shit. Okay. That's, but um, so leave it at that. So they were sort of talking under their breath about me, like a couple of them down the table. And like, I was talking, I was trying to teach a lesson and then I stopped and I'm like, mi scusi? Cosa detto? Allora? And boy, I, I like said like something like, lo sai che si capisco, eh? And Louis, Brava. And he, and his eyes just got really big. He's like, <laughs> oh, 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 mi spiace, scusa, mi, scusa, mi, eh? And it was hilarious because then I literally walked out because I was like really irritated. And I'm like, guys, class is done in English. I'm like, class is done. See you guys next time, whatever. I went to the bathroom. I come back out. There were four people left at the table. And they were like, literally, they looked at me and they're like, you know, scusa, Kate, uh, we're so sorry. These guys are assholes and blah, blah, blah. Like, we really appreciate you coming here. Cause I had to take the tram and then oh a bus God. like to get there. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you guys are wasting my fucking time if you're going to just sit there. 
But after that, like they were fine. Like then they understood they were, were joking. But it was so funny because I love seeing their faces. Mm-hmm. That's definitely like learning Italian that first time when someone underestimates you. It's like, N- no, I understood what you said. I heard what you called me. Like it's a nice little moment of pride. But it yes, is. I it got is. it. I did that a few times with some of the other classes at the school. And the people were just like, oh, oh, she, she know she's lived here before. Oh, okay. She understands. Oh, like, it was just so funny. <laughs> we get it. We get underestimate it being blonde over there. Oh, yes. That's yeah. for sure. They think we're like, they think we're dumb. They, they really yeah. do. Um, okay. I think, did I ask you that? Okay. You can tell me something different. Here. I feel like I write the same questions that I had. Up. <laughs> What's your most memorable thing? about Italy the thing that you just lights you up Mm. best memory or whatever take what you will with that there's so many um you can name them all we got time like that first (laughs) summer was so just picturesque like our professor um she did a really great job at kind of preparing us for going over there and the study abroad center it's a giant converted convent with like it's horseshoe shaped and there's a courtyard in the center of it and then the walls around it that everybody lives in dorms there's a dining hall and everything um so it felt like you're just living in a dorm but it wasn't just our school UT Austin that was there the center hosted a bunch of other colleges at the same time and everybody would bring their own professors and our professor really wanted to make sure that we were prepared to kind of be on our own over there. So it's like, I want you guys to go out in town. I want you to travel on the weekends. Like I want you to fully immerse yourself while in being in Italy. So we went over like how to read the trains and getting tickets. Cause back then there wasn't the option to push English. So like she taught us how to read the schedules. Like if you're going here, you need to look to the end of the line. And like, that's the ticket you push the button for. And she taught us all that stuff. We had little cell phones that we had to go and get refilled during the summer for just texting and calling each other. It's like we were, we were expected to adapt while a lot of the other schools that came over, the students just kind of used it as a dorm and they'd walk around town, they get a gelato, but they never really immerse themselves over there. And it's like, it just definitely in that first summer kind of feeling like a local and feeling like that place was a second home is a huge highlight knowing that yeah I can get on a train and get an Airbnb in a town and be fine and then get myself home um that was very memorable that first summer just being able to navigate Italy on our own um and then that just led to the other summers too like nannying they had a little scooter that I could use and just kind of like riding down the hill and then like a little chingali crossing the road and just like where am I <laughs> it's just that's so cool I've only ridden on the back of a scooter oh they're so much fun oh it was, I know. Like, it was the best thing about like yeah. I love that family um and nannying too but just like having a scooter it's like I can go where I want to when I want to <laughs> oh my gosh that's so fun it was cool. fun that's yeah so it's definitely like the feeling of independence over there and not just feeling like a tourist that's addicting. And that's what I feel like. I don't know what the kids are like nowadays when they study abroad, but I feel like when I was living over there and the big groups of students, like that's normal. Like we did that too, like going to the the, the American pubs and like all that stuff that trying to find Mexican pubs. food in Florence. <laughs> trying to find peanut butter when not when peanut butter was not there in, in Italy and now it is. You're welcome, everybody that wants peanut butter. In, in Florence, because yeah, that was probably our group of people, because literally I had a friend that had her dad ship over like two things of peanut butter. Oh. And I'm like, we're there for three months. Why do you need it? Oh, my God. But to go off your point of like, yes, finding your way in a foreign city or foreign land is so important, especially when we're of that age, like in our mid 20s, late 20s, early 20s, whenever it is. But I feel the same way. Like I like some of the other students that I studied with, like we would leave the hotel because we stayed in a hotel. No, there were a few guys, few guys, a foursome of guys that studied abroad with me that would not leave and just play cards like the whole time. They just wouldn't leave because they were afraid to speak the language and afraid to go out. So 
I think that that's a, just a, a strong point for people that are wanting to step out of the comfort zone of just being with a group of people, being with your teacher, being with um, maybe as a, a friend that speaks better Italian than you, doesn't matter, but just like getting out there, at least trying, because mm. what I've told so many people, which you know this as well, like Italians love that you try. Yes. At least they at value least, that. Immensely. They tell you like, you're not like, oh, well, I want this and a Caesar salad and Alfredo sauce. Like, you know, they, they, they value like you going like, vorrei un bicchiere. like try mm-hmm. to say the words because then you are taking your time to learn their language yeah. and not just expecting them to learn no English because that's what your, you know, mm-hmm. tour operator said, you know, like, I mean, this goes for older adults too, because I feel like even them, they're just like... <laughs> speak to me in my language and not like trying to trying to talk to them yeah so I think that was probably one of again one of my memories of just being able to just go out and just speak to people and like Mm -hmm. just go and like stop and when I lived there in 2005 I was by myself I lived with random people I didn't know so I would always go to my friend Simone's bar or something and just sit with him for a happy hour and like write in my journal. And like, he just like loved that because we would talk a little bit and then he, then, you know, I would leave by the time I would get rowdy, but like, but just being around it, like hearing the language. And I'm sure you did this too. Like just going into the, into the bar, into the cafe and just like following along with the conversations and you're hearing them talk about Berlusconi or like the weather or whatever. That's, that's, I think is such an important lesson for p- students that want to go like study abroad and they have to step out of their comfort zone and just mm-hmm. do it and just go. And-, and there's no excuse not to try anymore, especially with how good Google translate is. Like, we didn't have Google it. translate. We had little tiny dictionaries. Yeah. Like this is what I want. I want this. <laughs> <laughs> I want this thing. Oh no, not that one. This one. <laughs> like, yeah. It yeah. Now there's like Google translate where you just like hold the camera up over the menu and you know exactly what it is. It's just like, it, it, there's no excuse not to try now. Yeah. And even if you have to like, you know, replay it off of Google translate and try to That's fine. say it, fine, yeah. do it. My in-laws, this is another funny story. I don't think I told you this. My in-laws, um, met my parents and my younger sister in Venice when my, okay, long story. My cousin got married the same year we got married in 2014, Mm -hmm. but we couldn't go because someone was getting his green card. Side note. Anyway, so my in-laws wanted to meet my parents, but I'm like, okay, (laughs) they don't speak Italian and my in-laws barely speak English, but they literally had a conversation with Google Translate. It was like the cutest thing. My sister was taking pictures and like my dad, and then they were like, I could t- like, take pictures. And there's like one with my dad, like pointing at it. And my, my father-in-law was just like, <laughs> like laughing. How cute. And I was like, oh my God, that's just the cutest thing. Oh, but yeah, it's just so important to just like, like we've said throughout this whole thing, like immerse yourself, get out there and just try because yeah. Italians love that you try. They love that you're one. They love that you're spending money. Because that's yes. what we're going back in the fall. I'm going with you. I've already said it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they want you to try. And they want you to. Um, they want you to love Italy. The, like they have such pride for their country. And they just want to share that. And they want you to love it too. And it, exactly. it shows. Totally. Yeah. So let's go. and Let's plug your stuff here. Okay. So tell the people where they can go to sign up for your treat. How many spots do you have left for? Um, I've got two spots left in the villa this fall and three for half an hour going to. <laughs> then, then I guess I'm full. <laughs> and then I've got three left in Luca. Um, yeah. And then next year's a whole other barrel, but focusing on fall right now. <laughs> yeah, no, let's focus on fall. So um where can they um where can they find you? Um, it's wonderful retreats uh dot com and wonderful retreats on Instagram too. Cool. That's yeah. easy. Mm-hmm. Put that, I'm gonna put that on on the, the description. And then sketchy notions. Sketchy it, notions everywhere, sketchynotions.com and sketchy notions on guys, Instagram. Too. It's so simple to follow. Let's let's look it up and let's follow it up. Okay. Follow it up. I'm just <laughs> using <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I'm gonna follow it up. Um follow her. Buy her cards because her cards are amazing. They're so um 
personal. They're so, they have cats on them. Any of you guys like cats, cats and plants? And I see one behind you. My people. Too, so that's why I can see your plants. <laughs> um, and what else was I going to say to that? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm so, I'm, again, I'm going to say, I'm so grateful for meeting you. I deeply, deeply love you already. And it's only been a couple of years and I hardly like, I at least say that to my actual friends, but I do. I deeply love you. No, um, I appreciate you. And I honestly, I'm not kidding. Like, I kind of really do want to go. In the go. I got space. I don't know. So, <laughs> but thank you so much for being on my podcast. And um, we'll talk again soon. Bye, sure. Cool. cool. Ciao, Bella. Ciao, ciao. I am beyond grateful for you listening to my podcast right now. I am so excited to share my journey of living abroad and all my stories of Florence and Italy and all the places in between that I've visited. If this has reached you in any way and you would like to continue, please subscribe now. Also go check out my website trulyitaly.tours for all my travel experiences. Ci si vede. Ciao.